Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Clean Water Casting. I'm Joseph Benazia, and these uh, podcasts are brought to you by FloridaRightToCleanWater.org. This is the organization that is behind efforts to amend our state constitution, establishing a fundamental right to clean and healthy waters for all Floridians. In this podcast, we talk to experts about water quality issues in Florida. And today, our guest is Dr. Larry Brand. He is a professor in the Department of Marine Biology and Ecology at the Rosenstiel School of Marine Atmospheric and Earth Science, the University of Miami. His research interests include uh, phytoplankton ecology, including harmful algal blooms, about which he is regarded as one of the foremost experts in the state. Uh, Dr. Brand, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Look forward to it. Yeah. So uh, I think most Floridians are familiar with harmful algae blooms, uh, certainly in the form of red tides and blue-green algaes. Just how significant a problem is this in Florida? How concerned should Floridians be? Well, it's, it causes lots of fish kills. It kills lots of uh, endangered marine mammals, like dolphins, manatees, and so on. Um, it reduces light to the bottom, so it can lead to the death of a lot of our seagrass meadows, which are important habitats, and coral reefs, which are really important habitats. In general, it disrupts food webs and ecosystems in general. It's had made, these have had major effects on our aquatic ecosystems here in Florida. Uh, also, um, a number of these uh, algal blooms produce toxins. That again, kill the fish and so on. They can also uh, have effects on human health. Now, some of these are minor and there's just uh, inner irritation, but it goes it's a whole spectrum of toxins, a whole spectrum of effects, and some of these can kill people. I mean, some of these toxins can lead to liver cancer or other types of cancer, and also neurological problems, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. Um, these toxins end up in the water, they end up in our seafood. And in some cases, they even end up in the air. As an example, um, a number of years ago, we've had large toxins both on the West Coast and the East Coast. So like people who live right next to the water in Cape Coral on the West Coast and the people who live next to the water in Stewart on the East Coast, during these blooms, it got so bad. They were not swimming in the water. They're not eating the seafood, anything like that. But just the toxins in the air made them sick. And it was so bad, they actually had to abandon their homes for a period of time. So makes things very bad. Um, also, it affects tourism. I mean, you can imagine, it's not just the local residents, but uh, during times of, say, red tide on the West Coast, that's a huge tourist industry there on the West Coast. And all of a sudden, uh, hotel occupancy goes almost to zero. No one wants to go down to the beach if you've got a red tide. And of course, with the fish kills, it you know, has a huge impact on both the commercial fisheries as well as recreational fisheries. Uh, in other water sports and so on. So yeah, it, it does have a huge impact. Now, I might also point out that we don't know the full human health effects. We're learning more and more about this all the time. Uh, for example, the discovery that this, the, some of these toxins can lead to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS, that's a fairly recent discovery. And we have a feeling there's probably more toxins to be discovered, more human health effects that have long-term effects like this. Uh, well, that's kind of unnerving. Um, I live in Cape Coral, so uh, I experienced the, the red tide, the historic red tide and blue-green algae bloom of 2018, 2019 that you're referring to. People down here were very concerned, scared. Um, speaking about the economic impacts, I don't know if you are aware of it, but there was a study that was funded, done, uh, funded by some very prominent uh, environmental organizations down here about the economic impacts impacts if we would have another 2018, 2019. And we are literally talking about billions of dollars to our local economy, something like $17 billion in lost property value. So very, very big concern. I've been down here since 2016. Uh, there's a great deal of worry. Seems uh, Things seem to be getting worse. Are harmful algal blooms um, getting worse? Are they more frequent now? Are they more intense when they're here? Do they last longer? Yeah, that's my that's my impression. I did a statistical study on the red tide data. That's the specific red Florida red tide on the West Coast. 
And over about a 50 to 60 year period, looking at the data, I estimated it's about a 15 fold increase in the abundance of red tide. So that's a huge increase there. Uh, now, you can't just look from year to year. I mean, some, some years you have a red tide, some years you don't. So you can't do, look at the short term thing, but looking over a 50 year period, taking into account all that year-to-year -year variability and so on, there's been a dramatic increase overall okay, over that time period. In the case of the cyanobacteria, certainly there's a general impression by scientists and residents that there's been a dramatic increase in abundance of the blue-green algae blooms that are primarily under freshwater. I've not done a statistical analysis on that, but there does seem to be pretty good consensus that those blooms have increased as well. And so what is causing this? Well, the basic problem is excess nutrients. Okay, The two major nutrients you need to worry about are nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay, um, And it's the same nutrients that you use to grow higher plants. If you think about it, all the higher plants evolved from algae many hundreds of millions of years ago. So they need the same nutrients as algae do. So when you're growing crops for food, you're, using, you're putting on the land the same nutrients that you would Go out, and so then when you've got a runoff of that fertilizer into our local waters, they run downstream, and so you're generating your algal blooms um, downstream. To the extent that we eat these crops as food, these nutrients that don't disappear, they're going to end up in the sewage. So if that sewage is not dealt with properly, then that sewage can uh, lead to excess nutrients and harmful algal blooms as well. And so what you've seen is in the second half of the 20th century, you can actually look at, well, first of all, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of people, amount of agriculture in South Florida in the um, last half of the 20th century and continue on into this century. I mean, those are the two major sources, fertilizer from agriculture and then uh, sewage. Okay. Um, and you can see this in the, in, you know, the fossil records. So you can take cores, you see this dramatic increase in nutrients in the cores, in our groundwater, and so on. So it pretty much explains why we see this dramatic increase in these, these algal blooms here in, uh, in South Florida. A further problem that makes this even worse is that uh, Florida used to have large, number, large amounts of wetlands. I mean, Florida's pretty flat, and so we have a lot of wetlands. Well, Florida has now, as a result of this increase in agriculture and, and human population and so on, we've lost over 9 million acres of wetlands. Okay, now, wetlands naturally suck up nutrients. They store the nutrients. Okay? So you flow water through the wetlands, they take out, they clean up the water for you. They take the nutrients out. So the problem is when you now drain these wetlands, convert them into agricultural land or urban areas or whatever, you've turned this... Uh, nutrient sink into a nutrient source, particularly if you've got agriculture. So that's been a, a major problem. It converted 9 million acres of nutrient sinks into nutrient sources now. Okay, classic case of this is the Everglades agricultural area just south of Lake Okeechobee. Uh, it's about 700,000 acres just south of Lake Okeechobee. Uh, that's, the t that's the northern third of the Everglades, classic wetland, okay? well. During the 20th century, that, was, that 700,000 acres was drained, turned to agricultural land, primarily sugarcane at this point. So that's a huge area which has been converted from a nutrient sink to a major nutrient source here in, uh, in South Florida. So do we know the means of curtailing blue-green algae blooms and red tides? I mean, we, the governor um, formed a blue-green algae task force they made a lot, of, a lot of recommendations. Right. Well, the basic problem is you need, I mean, the problem is we have excess nutrients. And what you have to do is stop the release of those nutrients at their source. Okay. Now, the way I, I, I sort of have a simple way of looking at this. Okay. If I take my garbage and throw it into my neighbor's yard, okay, my neighbor is going to call the cops on me. They're going to sue me or something like that. Right. Mm hmm. Well, in a sense, that's what agribusiness is doing. They're taking all their waste runoff and dumping it into our public waterways, flows downstream and causing the alg algal blooms. Okay. And so, um, you know, look at this phase from a cost benefit point of view. Okay. Well, it's the people downstream 
that are having to pay the costs. And on top of that, taxpayers in general have to pay some of these costs associated with these harmful algal blooms. Whereas upstream agribusiness, they get the benefits. They make the profit off their off their operations. Okay. Um, so you know we have various laws about this. Not you know I'm not a lawyer. I don't really understand all this complex legal material and stuff. Uh, my um, my understanding of the legal system really just comes from talking with environmental lawyers, and you know I also on occasion uh, serve as a scientific expert witness in environmental cases, but I'm certainly not an expert. You know I can I can deal with the science part of it as an expert witness, but I let the lawyer deal with the legal. Mm -hmm. Understood. Yeah. But my impression is that while we have a number of laws on the books, a lot of them are not being enforced, and in other cases. They're really more like guidelines for voluntary. Well, they're voluntary laws, you know. You don't have to. And so it's, it's just think about it. Suppose our traffic laws were voluntary. In other words, you know, stop at that red light if you feel like it. Can you imagine what traffic would be like if, if our traffic laws were voluntary. Well, that's what we have with our waterways, you know, to a large extent. I, I like both of your analogies. Yeah. Um, another problem we have on top of that is uh, local communities, uh, counties, uh, municipalities, and so on. They often will then you know, they uh, pass laws to make sure their local waters are clean, but then the state comes along and overrules them. They are uh, preventing local communities from cleaning up their waters with their local laws, and that creates a problem as well. Okay. So the bottom line is we need to um, stop those nutrients at their source. Okay. Now, unfortunately, there are other ways that people propose to deal with this issue rather than stopping the nutrients being released at their source. Uh, one of the more popular ones that the state uh, depends upon a lot is to kill the algae blooms. Find some kind of magic toxin that's going to kill it. Okay, well, there's three fundamental problems with that. Okay. First of all, just the logistics of this. Okay. We get big blooms on Lake Okeechobee. Well, that's like half a million acres. Okay. We've had red tide blooms on the West Coast that are in over a million acres. Suppose you got this magic toxin. How many boats are you going to have to put out there to spray this toxin over half a million to a million acres. What's going to be the cost of that? How mm -hmm. much toxin are you going to need to do that? I mean, you know, that seems almost impossible, you know? The second problem with that is the blue-green algae, they first evolved about three and a half billion years ago. They were one of the first things they evolved. They've been around a long time. They're tough. It's not that easy to kill them. It's a lot easier to kill almost everything else, and they're the toughest, okay? So if you do find this magic toxin and you throw it in there, you're not going to just kill the blue-green algae. You're going to kill everything else as well. You end up, and you really want to turn Lake Okeechobee or the eastern Gulf of Mexico into a sterile swimming pool with no life at all. I mean, you're going to kill mm -hmm. the ecosystem in a sense. Okay. Um, and then the, the third problem is um, it's how you do this. Okay, you do kill the algae. Okay, so they die, they decompose, then they just release the nutrients back into the water, and you're back where you started. It's just like a, a swimming pool analogy, right? Mm -hmm. You add chlorine to kill algae and bacteria and so on. Well, the chlorine eventually dissipates. Mm -hmm. The nutrients are still there, and your microbes, your algae, and so it come right back. You have to keep adding that toxin over and over again to keep those algal blooms from occurring. If you, if you just add the toxin once, you, you can kill it maybe, but then you're going to kill a lot of things. And But eventually that algal bloom is going to come back because you have not gotten rid of the nutrients. Unfortunately, the state of Florida does spend millions of dollars every year to companies that are claiming they're going to find, you know, it's like snake oil, they're going to find some kind of magic toxin that's going to solve this algae problem. People have been talking about this for six and looking for these magic toxins for 60 or 70 years they haven't found one yet so it's pretty unlikely we're going to find some magic toxin and even if you did find a magic toxin you still have that logistical problem of spraying it over half a million million acres of land something like that 
and you're still not uh, curtailing the pollution at the source. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if you take it further, take this back a little bit further now, in other words, you can clearly show the link between excess nutrients and algal blooms and then to the toxins, human health and ecosystem health. If you take it back another step, though, in other words, I mentioned earlier, a lot of these laws are not very, well, just, I mean, bottom line is whatever laws we have, they're not working. Okay. And so you can ask why. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you take it back another step. Why do we allow all this nutrient runoff? Okay. And, well, just to give you a few numbers, the sugar, just take one agricultural business. Okay. Sugar. It's mm -hmm. major one here in South Florida. Okay. At the national level, level the federal government subsidizes the sugar industry to the tune of about four billion dollars a year at the local level within florida the sugar industry pays gives like three to four million dollars in lobbyist money to the state politicians so you can make the argument that it's this this money influence that's keeping our political system from enforcing nutrient runoff problems, which of course then leads to the algal leads to the nutrient runoff and then the algal blooms. And so the question is, um, you know, can your proposed constitutional amendment get around this money problem? It does appears to me anyway, it's a uh, a money influence problem. And so can this constitutional amendment get around that uh, that problem? Well, I'll speak to that um, because that's one of its uh, principal purposes. Uh, you brought up preemptions. I just want to inform people that amending the state constitution was not our original mission. Uh, Florida Right to Nature Network was working at local levels to pass right to clean water laws, Orange County being a prime example. Perhaps you are familiar with it. 89% of voters there in 2020 passed a right to clean water amendment. And then the legislature came in. They preempted the authority of local governments to do that. It was at that point that really we felt we had no other option than to go over their head, amend our constitution with this amendment. And it's it's pretty straightforward. The first thing it does, it establishes, it recognizes just how vital public interest, clean and healthy waters are uh, to many of the things that you already mentioned. And the basic legal mechanism is simply that if our state agencies are going to permit degradation of our waters, our ecosystems, our wetlands, they've got to have a compelling state interest to do so. Something such as releasing water out of Lake Okeechobee. When water levels become too high, you don't want to flood the surrounding communities. But even when there is a compelling state interest, they must do everything they possibly can to minimize the harm as much as possible. If uh, Citizens don't think that's happening with a fundamental right. We have the legal standing to take our agencies to court, and it's in the court, and I think you'll be very happy to hear this, much more insulated from the special interest, big sugar, big mining, et cetera, um, that it's the scientific information that gets focused on. In fact, the amendment actually says deference shall be paid to the latest scientific or the best scientific information. The court looks at that. It makes a ruling on the science, not on political influence. And then it can compel our agencies to do what they have to do to stop the harm. Agencies must comply because they're not allowed to disregard our Constitution. So uh, this is not an ideal, an idea that is novel to Florida. Uh, other states currently have environmental constitutional rights. 20 other states are pursuing them as well. And... Um, I think it allows us finally to sort of stand up to the special interests that you refer to uh, when our elected officials, you know, don't do that. So um, that's how the amendment works, uh, just for, so all our listeners would know. Um, I want to thank you today for uh, being so on target with all your remarks, uh, so insightful. Is there any other guidance or insight? that you would like to provide our listeners? Um, well, you know, you're proposing a constitutional amendment for clean water. Uh, well, another uh, constitutional right we have, of course, is to vote. And so that's important as well. Uh, but it's, you know, that's easier said than done. It's easy to vote, but 
voting for the right person is the problem. Because let's face it, all politicians are going to say they want clean water. No one's going to get up and say, oh, no, I'm, I don't care for clean water. You know, They mm -hmm. all say it. The question is figuring out which ones are influenced by the lobbyist money, which ones, and so on. And so it's important to do. It takes time to you have to vote very carefully. Mm -hmm. so they don't know. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Brand, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you. Uh, everybody, I hope you uh, will tune in to our next episode of Clean Water Casting. Have a great day today.